Hello everyone. Today we are going to go over the last chapter in this book, chapter 11, where we're going to talk about exit strategy. And this includes a planned exit for going public or going selling it to another company or a succession planning for within the same family. In this chapter, we first look at, at a conceptual level, the advantages and disadvantages of different uh, access strategies. And then we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts on comp computing pre-money pre -money and post-money valuation. These are particularly important nowadays because more and more companies are um, staying as private equity firm, meaning that they're not selling their shares to the public until much, much later. So companies will go through many rounds of financing. If these terms are new to you, um, don't worry, we're going to go over them uh, in this chapter. Again, I want to emphasize that uh, the textbook is important. We go into a lot more detailed discussion about concepts and definitions than I would be in this video. Uh, in this video, I highlight the conceptual relationships between, between uh, various strategy and then also, of course, a uh, practical calculation of how to compute valuation. Finally, we can look at um, the pros and cons of going public, which is one way of exiting. And then the other is um, succession planning in terms of passing it on to the next generation. For many entrepreneurs, sometime along the way during the growth of their firm, they will have to consider getting outside equity. And the main criteria that they need to take into account when they seek an outsider to invest in the firm is the amount of control that they need to give up. In addition to the control that they have to give up right away today, they also will have to give up future benefits. So those are the two costs that will uh, that the entrepreneur has to consider. So those are the those are important criteria. In exchange for that is how much money would they get today? in order to, for them to finance the growth that they need. So there are a few common characteristics and they are useful to keep in mind. First is that the amount of money that the entrepreneur needs is typically non-negotiable. The reason for that is an entrepreneur will most likely want to retain as much control as possible and to keep as much future benefits as they can unless they absolutely need the money to expand. So if they can get the money they need, there's no reason for them to give up control uh, and future benefit sharing. So the amount of money that they need is typically non-negotiable. So what is negotiable? What is negotiable is how much control and how much future benefits they need to give up. So this is, the, this is translated into the percentage of the company that they're giving up. So this is a per percentage of the post money ownership. Post money refers to after the new funds has been added to the firm. And that leads to the concept of pre-money valuation versus post money valuation. The company actually doesn't have a valuation pre-money because there is no market, there's no buyer for the firm. So the market value of a private firm is established after it has raised money, so post-money valuation. So the way that we figure out pre-money valuation is infer, meaning after we have computed post-money valuation. Here are the step-by-step -step, uh, process that you go through in the calculation. We'll also have an extended example at the end. So the number of shares that you're going to give out, give to the new uh, investor is equal to the percentage of post-money ownership that you're giving up uh, times the existing number of shares. And because this is post-money, so you have to actually um, divide that by one minus the percentage. So the, the reason is because we didn't know uh, how much percentage you're giving up until you have raised the money. The market value per share is defined as the amount of money that you, that you, get, that you raise. So again, that's non-negotiable. But the number of new shares that you give to the investor, that is the negotiation. And instead of negotiating in terms of number of shares, typically the negotiation is percentage ownership. And the post money valuation is very, very relatively straightforward. You take the market value per share times the total number of shares after the transaction. So the total number of shares include the new shares given to the new investor, as well as the existing shares owned by the entrepreneur. 
and the pre-money valuation is the post-money valuation that we just computed and infer from that minus the cash that you raise so again it may sound uh, not as obvious when you first look at it because um, you think that we know the pre-money valuation and then we can compute the post-money valuation but it's actually the other way around because there is no market for pre-money for the pre-money valuation the market value was established when the firm when the entrepreneurs seeks outside financing going along with the pre and post money valuation another important item to keep track of for a private firm is something called the caps table the caps table is short for capitalization table so in this table you keep track of the number of shares and also percentage ownership for each investor including the existing entrepreneur as well as the new outside investor next we're going to go over some terms that you may not have encountered before and some of these terms can sound very exoteric um, and, and there are stories behind the development of each term but I will not uh, go into too much of those details uh, you may you may discover that uh, along the way uh, what my goal here is to provide you with enough vocabulary so that you will have an intelligent conversation uh, with others in the industry as well as the ability to read financial news and also um, perspectives so financing rounds they are typically called uh, named as seed round and then series A series B so series A is the first major typically the first major round of financing obtained from a venture capital firm and then uh, the next round will be called series B series C uh, in the old days uh, typically a company will go through a round A or round B and then you'll go public nowadays you will see rounds going multiple go to D E F before a company goes public each time a company goes to seek money from the outside when a firm is private is when it is um, re-evaluating its market value so unlike a public firm where the stock is traded every single second or nanosecond on the stock exchange uh, a new market price is established each time the stock is traded a private firm is traded only when it goes for new financing so a new market value is established between each round so a market value is established at sit round and then we don't really know how much the firm is worth uh, from a market value sense until it goes for a series A and then you will be unknown again until the firm goes for a series B and so forth the change between rounds um, is similar to a change in market value so if the market value went up between round is called an up round an up round is an increase in market value and in an up round you know when everything is going well everybody is happy and there's really not much to be concerned about uh, everybody from the entrepreneur to the existing investors to the new investors everybody is happy typically things become challenging when you have a down round a down round is when the market value decreases so when your investment lose money obviously no one is happy and what is important in here is to decide who bears the brunt of the losses and in here the term in the deal in the deal terms becomes important so the deal term here are the fine prints that talk about what happened during a down run again uh, the deal term may include some terms in the up round uh, sometimes that may include a bonus to the entrepreneurs and so forth but very few people will have hard feelings during an up round because everything is good in the down round is when people really look at the fine prints in the deal, in the deal terms and figure out what is going on and who is going to bear the losses one of the very important term is something called an anti-dilution provision this is typically something negotiated by the um, a investor rather than the entrepreneur so let's say an entrepreneur goes to investor A during series A and investor A agrees to invest in the firm but has some reservation 
they are concerned that they will um, they may lose a lot of money. In that case, they may put in an anti-dilution provision. So there are a few options. If there is no anti-dilution provision, then the entrepreneur and the uh, investor share all the losses proportionally. So that means they uh, they are not protected. In a full anti-dilution provision, and meaning that there is no minimum price, we'll explain all of this in an example, then the owner bears all the losses. And then there is a case where the anti-dilution provision, but there is a minimum price. So what that means is that if the market value is the new market value, the new price is above the minimum price, the owner takes all the losses. But if the new market value, the new price is below the minimum price, then the, the uh, investor will share some of the losses. And this is an important part in the negotiation. So we talk about negotiation, typically the amount of money raised is not subject to negotiation, but the percentage is. Along with the percentage, there, may, there is also the anti-dilution pr provision. For example, if the owner does not want any anti-dilution provision, which means that the owner and the investor will face the same amount of risk, the investor may, de may demand a larger percentage of the firm in exchange for the money that they invest. On the other hand, the owner could offer a full anti-dilution provision with no minimum price, in which case they will bear all the losses if things don't go well. In that case, they may be able to negotiate a smaller percentage of the firm to give up in exchange for new funding. So all these are important negotiations. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, the negotiation focus on the amount of control, the share of future benefit, the amount of money that they raise today. And in here, we add a new dimension and that is risk. Who is taking the most risk? Here's a summary of the steps and the equations associated with computing the price for a down run when you have full anti-dilution provision. Um, I will not read out the formula here. Uh, they are just summarized here so that it's easier for you to um, put that into your model when you need to use them. And we'll also use this, uh, we'll go through an extensive example to, um, to demonstrate how this work. Uh, the most important thing for you to uh, understand is that the step and the process for computing the um, post value, post money valuation is very different depending on the anti-dilution provision during a down round. The one equation that I want to, po uh, to point your attention to is um, the owner's post round equity. This equation shows you that the owner takes all the losses. So the post round market value minus the new cash raise, so this is investment from the new investor, minus the original investor, investment of the previous investor. So this is the amount of cash that the previous investor put in. So the new investor get whatever they put in, the old investor did not lose any of the investment. So all the losses were borne by the owner. And here are the steps and equations related to a down round when the anti-provision has a minimum price. Again, I want to remind you that all these formulas are in, available in the textbook, of course. What I'm going to do here is just to give you a conceptual overview. So notice that the uh, value to the owner is not computed directly in here, but instead, we figure out what is the maximum total shares to the previous investor. So this is where the minimum floor price comes in. So what, what is, what is uh, included in here compared to when there's no minimum price is that instead of issuing as many shares as necessary to make the previous investor whole, there's a maximum that number of shares that we're gonna give them. So anything beyond that uh, will be um, 
it will represent um, the losses that is bear by the previous investor. And the losses oftentimes is um, you can see that in dollar dollar amount, but more importantly, is going to show up as percentage ownership. It is really really important for an entrepreneur or as a financial advisor to uh, to understand very deeply and clearly um, how um, equity financing. Um, works. Um, this is especially important in the negotiation stage and also in the decision stage. Remember that uh, you're always comparing the degree of control, the degree of future benefits, as well as the amount of money that you can raise today, which is oftentimes related to growth, and then the risk. So those are almost all the factors that we want to take into account. Once a firm reaches a certain stage, and there's another important uh, thing to keep in mind, even though nowadays venture capital firms are willing to hold on to company much longer as a private company, eventually the ultimate goal of a venture capital firm is either to sell the business to another company, um, and we talk about and we have the already described business valuation in the last chapter. And the second strategy, in, uh, if they are not selling the company to another investor or another business, then they will want to take the company public. Before you decide to go for to seek an outside venture firm, you want to keep that in mind because going public is oftentimes the final step for a venture capital firm. So here are some advantages and disadvantages of becoming a public company. The advantages is that you have access to capital. You also increase liquidity for shareholder. And this is a pretty important benefit. Remember the illiquidity discount that we use in valuation. This can be 20 to 30% of the firm's value. And directly related to that, you also lower your cost of capital because now as a public firm, the entrepreneur is no longer limited in its diversification benefits, so it will no longer have any unsystematic risk. And that goes along with the diversification. And sometimes this is important for some owner, uh, increased prestige and also visibility. So these are important criteria for you to consider. There are also disadvantages of becoming a public company. One is regulations and reporting. And as a, a, C, as a CEO of a private firm, you can make statements and you'll be fine. But as the CEO of a public firm, when you make statements, you, will have, you, you are subject to SEC regulations. And more, uh, somewhat recently, a very famous CEO, Elon Musk uh, of Tesla, has made uh, oftentimes um, issue tweets on Twitter um, that got him into trouble because they those tweets are considered public statements and they are subject to SEC regulations, and he has been fined for them. Another perhaps more important um, consideration is the scrutiny that the firm will now be subject to um, by financial analysts. So every statement, every financial statement, um, every um, innovations that the firm make will be closely monitored by financial analysts. And coming along with that is the pressure to make to meet quarterly estimates. And so it's not up to the firm to make projections. Financial analysts will make their own projections. And some of you who want to become a financial analyst or a CFA, that's uh, really our job uh, to analyze a firm and um, provide our own estimate about its future. And once you put an estimate out there, then the company executives will feel obliged to meet those estimates because not meeting an analyst estimates can result in um, a quite significant decrease in stock prices. Um, so along with the scrutiny by financial analysts, you also draw public scrutiny because now your company is more visible. And all this can be distractions uh, from successfully running the company. So before you go public and before you even consider seeking um, funds from a venture capital firm, you want to carefully consider the pros and the cons of going public. 
If you decide to not go public and not seek uh, outside funding, um, you can still be very successful. However, a company oftentimes, especially a successful company, will last longer than a single person's life. So eventually, you may want to take some time off and you may want to decide what to do with the business. So succession planning is um, very important for any business. And you want to do that before the time comes. So you want to think ahead of time so that you can carefully plan for it. So you will need to have uh, this oftentimes very difficult discussions uh, to talk to your children about who will take the lead and and what will the other children do. So this is uh, this may sound common sense, but I have actually consulted with a, uh, and written a case on um, a, a company that uh, went through this process. And I'll give you a preview on that. Um, what happened is they, the owner actually have two of her, his children working in the company and they had talked about a succession plan. And then in the end, the father decided to sell the business to an outside firm and distribute the funds to the children instead um, of passing the company onto the, onto the children. So succession planning is not always easy. So some of the questions that you may want to take in, 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 into account is fairness, right? That's an important criteria. And the other thing to keep in mind is that fair and equal are not always the same. Uh, so if you have a, ch a child who would like to be in the business, uh, and another child who doesn't want to be in the business, how can you how can you make that fair? Obviously, equal will not work in that case. Um, and then this is uh, for those of you who are interested in financial planning. Uh, estate planning is very important. Um, so how will what are the tax consequences? What are the uh, do you have to set up trust? And all those are important uh, consideration. And the and the question I'm diverting a little bit from entrepreneurial finance into financial planning, but uh, since I know a lot of your finance students, uh, this is something that you definitely want to take into account. You want to talk to the client. You want to talk to the uh, family about their priorities. Uh, whether it is for this generation, for the next generation, or for a longer time horizon, uh, what are their tax uh, policy, what are their tax philosophy, um, how much does the owner need for retirement? And in fact, this was one of the criteria that um, my the firm that I consulted with uh, ultimately take into account because the children were not able to cash out the father and the, the, the parents' need for retirement exceeded what the children can pay them out right away. And then finally, this is important as well, what is best for the company. You don't want to pass on a company to your children just because they are your children. They may not be the best manager. They may not be even be interested in the industry. Finally, this is the most important. Um, in finance, we oftentimes focus on money uh, and the numbers, but in real life, particularly in financial planning and in entrepreneur finance, emotion outweigh a lot of other financial factors. So how can you make the founder feel confident? So in, in terms of succession planning, it's important that the core value of the founder will continue beyond his legacy. Now we're going to turn to the apply side of today of this chapter. Uh, we'll end the video here. In the next video, we're going to go over uh, an, an, Excel, uh, an Excel example where we'll um, go through the pre and post money valuation in various uh, scenarios. We will look at an up round, uh, a down round with the various anti-dilution provisions. See you again soon.